OK, I'll start the housekeeping. I think we'll, I might have to do this once twice while people are still joining us. My name's James Thompson. Good evening, everyone. I'm the Senior Communications Manager at the Healthy London Partnership, HLP. Welcome along. Uh, so I shall start with a bit of housekeeping. As mentioned, if you kindly turn off your microphones and your cameras, if you're not presenting, that would be fabulous. We are recording this evening, so do be mindful of that. Wow. So and uh, we will be sharing that recording afterwards. It will be on the HLP website and we will also email it direct to you if you've signed up through Eventbrite, which I think many of you have. We're going to save questions and answers to the end. Uh, our speakers have agreed to do a Q&A there, so please put any questions in the chat box. What we'll do is hopefully we'll get through all of them. We've got a strong track record on that so far. Uh, but if we don't, we'll come back to you directly afterwards and make sure everything gets answered. So do put the chat in there. That would be fab. So we've got a great session tonight. So we're tackling uh, homeless health and primary care. This is part one of a two-hander. And we've got two great speakers here tonight. So I'm going to do a brief intro about those guys, but I will let them introduce themselves more fully. But... This evening, we had Dr. Caroline Shulman. She's a GP in Homeless and Inclusion Health at King's Health Partnership, and part of the Pathway Homeless Team. Also, Honorary Senior Lecturer, UCL, Acting Homeless Health GP Specialist and Clinical Advisor for us at the Healthy London Partnership as well. We also have Dr. Zana Khan, another GP in Homeless and Inclusion Health, another Pathway Fellow, and NI, NI, I knew I'd stumbled over this bit, NIHR and Practice Research Fellow at UCL. Um, I'm going to hand over to the experts and I'll come back with you uh, towards the end. But before I hand over to our speakers, just one more reminder, please make sure your cameras are off. Please make sure you're on mute and questions in the chat box. Um, Caroline, I think I'm handing it across to you, am I? Thank you. Yes, James. Hi. Thanks very much. Evening, everyone. Um, so I'm a, yes, thanks for the introduction. So yes, I'm Caroline Shulman. I'm a, a GP, uh, worked in homeless and inclusion health for around the last 12 years um, in specialist primary care and now currently in a multidisciplinary pathway team in a hospital in, in South London. Um, but also recently I've been working with Healthy London Partnership on the homelessness pan London uh, approach. Um, to try and support people in, in hotels and, and moving on. Um, I've also been doing quite a lot of work over the last number of years um, around palliative care and homelessness. But I'm going to hand over now to Zana, who is going to start the presentation as well afterwards. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you, James. Uh, yes, I'm Zana Khan. Um, I've worked in homeless uh, health care in primary care and like Caroline for a pathway homelessness team in South London. Um, for the best part of a decade um, and um, I've also been working with Healthy London Partnership to support their delivery of um, homeless health care during the pandemic. Um, my research interests at UCL are focused really around uh, training of frontline staff, um, particularly using interprofessional and collaborative learning methods, um, of which web-based learning appears to be one of the key ones going forward, I think. Um, so we're going to get started with the presentation um, I'm kicking off Unknown today. Unknown participant is now joining. Thanks, Caroline. And we're going to be covering some of the background um, on homeless and inclusion health, um, particularly some of the research and data that will help you contextualise um, the healthcare needs of people experiencing homelessness and more broadly so social exclusion. Um, we're going to take you through how uh, we've um, worked across not just London but the UK in the pandemic response to COVID-19 and the opportunities that that has brought as well as the wider and ongoing opportunities both past, present and future for primary care including strategies that will um, um, help you be able to support people experiencing homelessness and social exclusion in your practice and your locality. We're briefly going to cover the very, very key headline points on, on housing and on the very challenging issue of um, immigration and no recourse to public funds so that you've got a little bit of an overview of that. And then we'll be um, taking some of your questions at the end. Next slide, please. 
Um, so many of you, I'm sure, will know this, but uh, rough sleeping, although very, very visible, is really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to homelessness. Um, people experiencing homelessness um, have many different forms, and um, and many of many people are in uh, often in very insecure accommodation, in temporary accommodation, which can sometimes last for several years. Um, they may be staying with friends or family, living in squats, um, or staying in a, a homeless hostel, um, which historically have really been there to support people to uh, transition um, when they need more support um, from homelessness into more independent dependent accommodation settings. But as we'll discuss, increasingly people living in, in homeless hostels tend to be there for very long periods of time and, and more and more they tend to have very complex uh, physical health needs um, and the management of those in the hostel setting is often suboptimal. Um, so it's just to give you really an overview of the fact that, that although we're largely talking about rough sleeping today, let's not forget about all the other aspects of homelessness and why this is a really important question to ask patients when they're registering or, or when you're seeing them in your practice or if someone's consultation pattern changes, asking them about their housing status is, is key. Next slide, please. So um, this is a slide about London. We'll talk about the rest of the UK shortly. Um, but the pattern really is reflected nationally um, around Great Britain. Um, rough sleeping has increased year on year. Um, by 2010, we'd almost eradicated rough sleeping and gradually that's increased um, really quite quickly um, as a consequence of austerity, um, changes in the provision of welfare and, and benefits support, um, a reduction in social housing and availability of that has also impacted incomes often declining as a result of all those other changes. Um, and what we've also seen is an increase in the number of people living in temporary um, and insecure accommodation such as bed and breakfast or short term housing. Um, measuring homelessness is difficult. We have a rough idea of the number of people residing in homeless hostels in London, um, although that has, as it has across the country, decreased by almost a third over, um, over the last 10 years. And that means that there are fewer places of support and less support available in general. So for people who are in hostels, but also people who are in other forms of accommodation, who perhaps need more support on, uh, on a short or longer term basis to manage um, their, their tenancy. Next slide, please. And as I said, um, capturing the numbers of homeless uh, people in the UK is a difficult task. And um, Suzanne Fitzpatrick, Len Bramley, um, Jenny Wood, Beth Watts are part of a, a, a research institute at Harriet Watt University called the Institute for Social Policy, Housing and Equity Research. And they work with the charity Crisis to produce a homelessness monitor and have uh, very robust methods for triangulating and capturing the number of people experiencing homelessness, also using local authorities, so housing office data, as well as many other sources um, to try and give more robust figures. And as you can see nationally around the UK, all forms of homelessness um, have increased, particularly people who are um, living in insecure accommodation, um, people living in, in unsuitable temporary accommodation, and as we know, rough sleepers. Um, so this national picture really is one that I think everybody who's watching this webinar will be fully um, aware of from their own practice and also from what they from what they see. Um, next slide, please, Caroline. And you may be wondering, well, what are the underpinning causes of homelessness? And this has also been very thoroughly uh, researched with an increasing um, evidence base supporting the impact of adverse childhood events and complex trauma, often beginning in childhood and then that carrying on into adulthood. And what we see is a combination of structural and policy um, of causes combined with individual factors. Um, so partic in particular, changes in, in housing supply and affordability of housing, um, income and poverty have dramatically increased. Um, 
loss of support services and that's from childhood you know, onwards into into adulthood and loss of key health services such as substance misuse services with increasing numbers of people um, in both in prison and then also leaving leaving prison in the criminal justice system without any ongoing support um, and what this the causes also indicate the solutions um, and by that I mean that health and social care cannot alone um, end homelessness it's one one pillar in what um, we often describe as the four pillars um, of inclusion health and that is that health and social care needs to meet the needs of everybody in the community we need adequate affordable housing but also places of care for people who need more support um, income and benefits so that people can live with dignity and tailored support throughout someone's life course um, so that so that there is the support there to manage issues as they come up through through an individual or a family's life and We'll just pick up again on adverse child experience in, in the next slide, please, Caroline. So I've, I've mentioned this already, but uh, one of the one of the um, key aspects of adverse childhood events and complex trauma is how it impacts somebody through their life course and their their reactions and, and their um, psychological um, management of emotions can become very challenged. So when we meet people who um, who perhaps have very defensive or aggressive behaviour, that's often underpinned by complex trauma and the experiences that, that they've had. And fear, which is a very powerful emotion, um, is often um, is often the underpinning cause of um, of challenging behaviour and how we ourselves um, recognise our own emotions within that um, is key to how we communicate and engage um, with people experiencing social exclusion and actually all our all our patients and it's something that we in primary care are very very well trained to to do and to, to cope with challenge to cope with conflict to cope with our own behavior um, and our own emotions within that context um, next slide please caroline and and the impact of this you know is really quite profound of of um, self-harm of um of mental illness, um, of soothing behaviours such as substance misuse, of entrenching in, in homelessness to avoid contact with others. Um, and then these features of, of impulsivity, of, of hypersensitivity and vigilance, which come with, with experiencing trauma. It's very difficult to, um, to disengage from that as an, as an individual. And as I said, that feeling of, of feeling unsafe or fear really underpins um, much, of, much of this. Um, We'll talk in, a, in towards the end about some of the resources that you can access to learn more about complex trauma and adverse childhood experiences and how those impact individuals. Um, and you, you know, you, you will see some of the names of the people involved in this research are often psychologists with special uh, training to support people who are experiencing um, adverse events and complex trauma through their lives. Thank you, Caroline. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, so, as Zana's outlined, we, we know that there's a lot of complexity that actually is underlying a lot of people's um, roots into homelessness and um, experience while homeless. And this is then associated, we know, with often what we describe as trimorbidity, um, with a combination often of substance misuse, mental health difficulties and physical health problems. Um, we know that substance misuse, mental health difficulties can be both a cause and an effect of homelessness. And it's a, it's a two directional issue which often can get um, much worse as 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 time in homelessness increases. Um, so we know that around 60% uh, of people with a history of rough sleeping have a substance misuse issue. Mental health, 70% reaching the criteria for personality disorder with a high proportion having dual diagnosis, so a combination of mental health difficulty uh, with substance misuse and much higher prevalence of psychosis as well. 
But we also know there's really very profound physical impact um, in, in this population. So with very, very high rates of hepatitis C, TB, but also long term conditions, heart disease, COPD, strokes and epilepsy are, are very, very high. And we know there's really high rates of multimorbidity and early onset ageing uh, with high frailty as well within this with this cohort. Um, so um, in terms of acquired brain injury, this is often under-recognised, but it's an enormous problem that we're finding more and more, um, particularly if we look for it. So people often, um, head injuries actually are, are um, very common amongst people prior to becoming homeless, as well as after becoming homeless. So it's actually a, a, a major risk factor. Traumatic brain injury is a, is a risk factor for homelessness. But also once somebody is homeless, they are very, very much more likely to have traumatic brain injuries as well. And then, of course, alcohol related brain injury is massive. So we, we're finding more and more people with very complex needs, very, co very complex cognitive deficits, which can cause a uh, real difficulty with executive functioning. But this is often really not recognised and um, their needs are often really not met. Um, we, we often find people on the street, but also in the hostel pathways who have quite profound cognitive impairment and, and often not nearly enough support wrapped around them. Um, this is from a, a, another study that's come from uh, the, the team at, at UCL, um, Dan Lua um, and team. And this has shown really the very high prevalence of conditions um, in the homeless population um, and compared even with people in the in the highest index of multiple deprivation. So the dark blue is people in, in the high end of the in index of multiple deprivation. So some of the most deprived in the community. But the red is people who are homeless. So you can see here um, how high uh, the prevalence ratio is for, for, for certainly COPD, epilepsy, heart disease, strokes and, and asthma. Um, and in fact, we did a, a, a small study. This was led by um, an amazing uh, Dr. Rafi Rogans Watson, who is a specialist um, registrar in healthcare of the elderly. And um, we looked at uh, virtually everyone within one hostel. Um, it was a hostel that takes people over the age of 35, so a slightly older cohort, but the average age was 55. And amongst that, everybody had at least two long-term conditions and the average number of conditions was over seven and there was a really high frequency of premature onset frailty and and uh, geriatric conditions so falls mobility issues low grip strength visual problems more than 50 percent cognitive impairment again 45 percent so you can see malnutrition really really high um, and urinary incontinence so a really vulnerable population um, in a hostel living in a hostel often with very little um, adequate uh, care or social care um, or health support and paul is just um, one one person from uh, a hostel um, at the age of 52, um, he had a long history of rough sleeping um, in and out of temporary accommodation, which kept falling through. He had a, a, an alcohol dependency issue. He'd had a very troubled early life um, and also had severe uh, COPD. This isn't his name and this isn't his picture. Um, but um, again, he was being supported uh, remarkably well by as, as well as they could by hostel staff. Um, caring for him. He had some uh, in-reach GP support, which was was fantastic. Um, but every time he had a hospital admission, um, he was uh, deemed to have no additional uh, social care needs, so was discharged back to the hostel without support. Um, and very sadly, uh, Paul died um, at the age of 52, following about a week following um, being discharged from hospital, having been found to have no care and support needs. Um, he was cared for um, and to the end by the magnificent hostel staff um, that, that were looking after him. Um, 
So we often find that, in fact, hostel staff or outreach staff are, are the nearest a lot of people have to a next of kin. Uh, we know that many people um, who are homeless, this was from a study that Salvation Army did many years ago, but it's uh, it's still very, very prescient today. Um, many had few um, or limited contact with family members and the majority found themselves to have sort of no close friends or, or were very isolated. And that's often even within a hostel setting. So I'm going to very briefly talk about um, some of the barriers that people experience, but this is going to be explored much greater, much in much more detail in the second webinar, which I would urge you, if you can, to, to join as well. Um, so we know that often health isn't a priority, that there's a there's a real, uh, partly because of all the other challenging needs that people have. And people often feel a real distrust and they don't feel welcome within services. And again, you know, when we talk about complex uh, trauma during childhood and then repeated trauma during homelessness, this can be a, a real issue. Some people find it difficult to register with the GP, even though everyone is entitled to register with the GP, um, irrespective of whether or not they have forms of ID or a proof of an address. Um, but obviously appointments in primary care and secondary care, all appointments are usually inflexible and we know that there's a real low threshold for um, discharging people if they don't attend. There's also a really underlying fear of withdrawing, particularly um, going to secondary care. Um, and we know that that people, particularly if they have an opiate addiction or an alcohol addiction, they really don't want to go uh, uh, into hospital if they can help it. Um, and then they often therefore seek treatment when their problems are very, very advanced um, and you know, use A&E rather than primary care, rather than preventative services. So we know also from our hospital work, there's a high rate of self-discharge, which is why I think our hospital pathway teams work very hard to try and prevent people from self-discharging. And we try and work with people when they are in hospital uh, in a holistic and, and, and person-centered way within a multidisciplinary team um, to try and really improve um, safe discharge from hospital. Um, but that will be explored uh, in much greater length um, later on this week in the second webinar. So just a couple of very quick quotes. Um, I think there's a stigma and some professionals see it as a choice. You choose to pick the can up and put it in your mouth rather than you being mentally and physically sick. So they just think you're wasting our time. Had a guy who was in a lot of pain from a spinal abscess, was injecting, wasn't on a script, so had a massive fear of the amount of time it was going to take to go through A&E, get on a ward and be prescribed and titrated, and the amount of withdrawal he was going to experience. So these are these are real challenges for, for people, for healthcare providers, as well as the individuals who are experiencing this ill health. And with all of this, this burden of ill health, um, uh, poor engagement often with health services and barriers to health services, um, it's not surprising that we have these dreadful statistics um, of people experiencing homelessness dying incredibly young. So people who are rough sleeping or using emergency, uh, emergency shelters, average age of death is in their 40s. And um, again, another study from the amazing UCL group um, published in The Lancet, um, <clears throat> that um, when you look at um, the index of multiple deprivation, so 10 being the most severely deprived in our populations compared with one the most affluent, um, as we often hear the statistic, people who are in deprived areas, they have maybe twice the rate of death compared with the most affluent. However, when you actually is now joining um, hope people who are homeless, prisoners, sex workers or substance use disorders, you're moving away from this slope of inequality to this cliff edge of inequity, as uh, our story often refers to, where you're talking about people having uh, uh, eight to 12 times higher uh, standardised mortality rates. So COVID. Well, because of this vulnerability, it's been recognised nationally that 
something had to happen, that people experiencing homelessness were going to be extremely vulnerable um, if on the street and also in shared spaces uh, where they were unable to social distance. So the aim was very much to reduce those shared spaces and support people into accommodation where they can self-isolate. So the winter night shelters um, the, where they're all the hubs where a lot of people would be in one space, um, often sharing a floor, were closed um, and rough sleepers and people from those shelters moved into accommodation, which um, has been mainly through hotels. Um, there's also been a drive to support discharge from hospital, so to ensure that people aren't discharged to the street. And so a number of hos hospitals have set up um, but more step down or they've moved into the hotels. So there has been these hotels set up there. There's a number, quite a number in London. There's um, a number run by the GLA, so around uh, 1300 people in those. But we know there's around another three, three to four thousand, at least in local authority hotels as well to uh, support people to social distance. In addition to social distancing, there's also been a, a massive program to ensure that people who are symptomatic with COVID potentially being identified, tested and supported to self isolate with a COVID care facility as well. So it's been an incredible feat, really. Um, shielding, um, I know everyone here is very aware of this, uh, the, the, the need for shielding. Uh, so I won't say more around this slide um, in terms of extreme vulnerability. But what I will say is that I think that in terms of the homeless population, there's probably an under recognition of those who do need shielding. Um, for example, um, many would have severe respiratory disease, but they may not be engaged with GPs. They may not be on the recommended treatments that were suggested for defining uh, people needing shielding. Um, but the British Lung Foundation have a very, very useful uh, link around shielding uh, using NICE's definition of severe COPD. Um, I think many people who are experiencing homelessness, who are currently in the hotels, who are currently um, being is probably being moved on from hotels um, will fall into categories um, often due to their COPD. So they should fall into a shielding category. And that includes people with an admission to hospital because of an acute attack of, from their lung condition, uh, people with very limited breathlessness, um, and people with multiple medical problems. And we know that many, many people have multimorbidity, as we've already um, seen. So I think this is a almost to everybody out there who is in primary care to think about identifying your homeless population or in identifying and thinking whether or not um, or people who are maybe newly registering with you and coming out from the hotels because um, this has been an opportunity um, really um, as we can see. Um, for getting more and more people engaged into healthcare. So we know that um, a large number of people who have been placed in hotels have not been registered uh, with GPs ever. Um, some have been registered but have been disengaged for a very, very long time. Um, so this is a real opportunity to help people uh, explore and turn around their, their life and their, and their health needs. Um, so I would um, urge anybody who is approached um, by people coming from the hotels that this is this is such a, a useful and an important intervention. It's the it's the first stage for helping to support people get their lives back on track. At the moment, there is some limited health support into some of the hotels, um, and many many people have now been linked into substance misuse services and uh, received support around smoking cessation. So there's been a, a wonderful response from substance misuse in London with a pan London um, helpline and approach linking in with all the local services and that's been incredibly helpful. The government is committed and saying they're committed that no one should return to the street. Um, so we are remaining cautiously optimistic that that will be the case. Um, but um, also the time in the hotels, people have been in the hotels now for often a couple of months and for some people it's been an extraordinary opportunity for them to reflect on their lives, reflect on what they want going forward and has been a real opportunity for change and we've heard some wonderful, wonderful stories about that, how that has really had a major impact where they're not having to worry about eating and, and sleeping and where they're going to be and also getting their, their, their drugs for self-medicating. It's all been there to support them. 
Um, there's also been a real drive to get people registered. So there's been a, 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 a but there are still many people who haven't got registered yet. But it's been cascaded and agreed through STPs and CCGs that people really, really, you know, there needs to be support for each hotel. There need to be recognised um, GPs who are prepared to register people. Um, and homelessness is now, there's a section within the new general practice SOP that has recently come out. So um, there's a link to that there. So this is this is real opportunity, I think, to really address this inequality that we have. Um, so in terms of primary care, um, as we've said and you know and you've heard and you know um, most people experiencing social exclusion need much better integrated care to address the range of issues um, and it's it's like the sort of inverse care law we need to give the um, most or as Michael Marmot says proportional universalism so we need to give more to people with the most need to have some form of equity um, so obviously you know, role of GPs initially, yeah, registering with, with primary care, um, identifying those who need shielding, as, as we've discussed, and really seeing how we can support a tailored person-centred approach with people who have multiple and complex needs. So it may be worth thinking and reflecting on how inclusive and flexible your practice is and if there's any way of improving or increasing that. Um, but again, problems are so complex and it can't just be one professional group to do this alone. So we really need to work uh, with other agencies and work out how we can improve that multi-agency working. Um, so obviously that, that includes coordinating access to substance misuse, mental health, social care, palliative care, but also maybe linking with housing and benefits. But I suppose the idea of um, of registering someone with all these multiple and complex needs is extremely daunting. Particularly, we know that everyone is incredibly struck struck with with with. There's no time for anything at the moment. Everyone's under enormous pressure, um, and so that is absolutely recognised. Um, but I think an approach that that I've always found really really useful is to recognise that you know. You can't can't solve everything in one go, um, and I think it can take it can take weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months or years, to really help support people over time to get their lives back on track and to start addressing their health and other issues. And working as a specialist um, GP in homelessness, I was you know really fortunate to be able to develop those sorts of relationships with with a number of my patients and really see change and see them getting getting some form of normality in their lives, but it could take a long time. So I, I would suggest that what's really important when people first register is to try and ensure that they're going to come back and see you um, to develop that rapport, build up that trust um, and try and identify and address priorities that are their priorities rather than what might be our priorities. Um, other people could be really valuable support workers, outreach workers that that um, they may be already linked into to, to get support. Um, and then obviously the next stage is working on other urgent issues, but arranging for follow up soon, offering them another appointment uh, in a week, in two weeks, if you if you possibly can. But again, this is going to be explored further as well in the second webinar uh, later on this week. Um, I'm putting this up here. I mean, this is something that comes from our homeless palliative care toolkit that we've developed. I just I just love the slide. It just it's a way. To, how do, how can you frame dealing with someone with all this complexity? Um, well, you can ask them what's important. You can put them in the centre. This doesn't have to use this. It's just a way of sort of mapping and using mapping as a person centred approach to care um, that I think can be extremely useful and helping them to define what their priorities are and starting from where they are and working alongside them um, and with them. Um, I'm now going to hand over back to Zana. Thanks, Zana. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly cover um, some key points about housing and um, the latest uh, statutory um, guidance and legislation um, and things that you can do um, in your practice to support accessing housing for, for vulnerable people. So back in 2018, um, the charity crisis supported the government to uh, put a new bill through Parliament 
and it was called the Homelessness Reduction Act, and it was widely supported and it was actually passed through all the various processes very, very quickly and was enacted in April 2018. And the aim was to reduce the variation experienced by people experiencing homelessness when they were trying to access accommodation. And much of this was based on previous research, quite a lot of it done by crisis, which um, was often um, uh, mystery shopper exercises where vulnerable people would attend uh, councils and local authorities. Um, and the experiences that they had perhaps weren't in line with current reg legislation, so people who really should have been housed perhaps weren't. Um, and uh, and these problems were, were seen nationally, but there was also considerable variation. Um, then in, in 2018, the, the Homelessness Reduction Act was then um, uh, engaged, which then placed additional uh, legal responsibilities on local housing authorities, so the local council, to assess and provide assistance and to prevent homelessness um, in anyone who is currently experiencing homelessness um, and also anyone who is at risk of homelessness within the next 56 days. So that includes people who are at risk of eviction from their current um, property or their, their current tenancy. And as time has gone on since 2018, we've seen increasing numbers of people um, um, experiencing poverty and, and financial hardship um, and that has meant that one of the main causes now of homelessness is people being evicted from accommodation so we sort of have um, you know maybe two core groups of people experiencing homelessness one is people who have perhaps had more complex trauma through their childhood and and um, early adulthood and then an increasing number of people who are very new to homelessness where acute forces have resulted in 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 a life change so in, in October 2019, um, you may have heard about the duty to refer, which is a responsibility by a number of uh, public bodies, about a dozen in total, including um, acute healthcare services, social care, prisons, the police, to refer anybody who is at risk of homelessness um, or currently homeless to the local authority. Um, but it doesn't just apply to acute services like acute hospital wards and urgent care centres, anybody, anybody in primary care, in in secondary care, in community-based services, can make a referral under the duty to refer. It's very, very easy to do. There are standardised emails that you send, and all it needs is for somebody to, um, to take consent from that person, a phone number, contact details, their last address if if you have it or if they have it, um, and to send that to the duty to refer email. And by doing that, it does it does two things. First of all, it triggers um, a case to be opened. Um, it doesn't guarantee housing, but at least that is being that is information that is being recorded. Um, and and according to the the Homelessness Redu Reduction Act, there should be some sort of assessment as a consequence of the referral. And I would encourage you to to look this up. It doesn't have to be a clinician. It can be um, someone in the admin team, a receptionist, and as I said, anybody within the community teams. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's sent more than once or twice or thrice. As long as it's being sent, then the the local housing authority will then uh, pick that case up. And this is even more important during the pandemic. I'm we don't know yet. What is going now to happen joining. Uh, going forward. So making sure that people are are sheltered um, if there is a second if there is a second spike of COVID-19 is essential so that they have the ability to self-isolate um, uh, into the winter months. Uh, next slide please. Now it's still very challenging to get people through the um, the um, the full housing duty, which means that they are then owed a, a longer term duty um, of housing by, by the local council. Um, they need to prove that they're homeless. Um, well, they need to prove that they're priority need, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, they usually have to be eligible for housing benefits. Um, they usually have to demonstrate that they've not made themselves um, homeless. Um, and that can be done accidentally. It's very easy to become intentionally homeless. Um, by, for example, if you've been given an eviction notice and you leave before the bailiffs arrive, you can be considered intentionally homeless, which I know sounds unbelievable, but but that has been the case for many people. Um, and then one of the most difficult things, particularly for people who have experienced more longer term homelessness or who have been transient across different areas and in cities, this is particularly problematic where we have lots of different boroughs. 
is demonstrating what's called a local connection. And this is a local settled connection to a particular area, usually a local borough, for at least six out of the last 12 months, but usually and increasingly councils are asking for three out of the last five years. I want to come back to priority need um, because I'm often one of those common questions that I'm asked is about how can healthcare and are we allowed to write letters to support housing? And the answer to that is yes you can and they're really really helpful the one thing i would urge you not to do is to charge people for a letter of housing support people requesting um, medical support letters around accommodation are requesting it because they're really in desperate need um, if they're asking you for help to prevent them becoming homeless because of a health problem so they may be at risk of eviction or losing their accommodation um, a, a, a factual letter outlining uh, that person's vulnerabilities can go a long way to helping the council understand those issues and enabling them to understand what sort of support that person might need so that their homelessness prevention teams can act with, with a greater certainty around the needs of that particular person. Next slide, please, Caroline. So now on to the thorny issue of um, some of the immigration issues and no recourse to public funds. So this is a term you may or may not have heard of, um, and it's become a, a you know a little bit of a sort of colloquial term in, in our sector. It, people who experience no recourse to public funds, and this means people who are, are not eligible for some statutory services, for example, things like housing benefit um, or, or housing more broadly, often include people who are migrants, uh, visa overstayers, people who've been refused asylum, and actually some EU citizens as well um, who are deemed not to be exercising their treaty rights, so they may not be working, may have never been able to work for whatever reason, or perhaps have only worked for a short period of time and therefore aren't necessarily el eligible for things like housing benefits. Um, but what we found is that a very large number, proportion of the patients who are residents rather, who are in the hotels um, are foreign nationals. Um, many of them are not eligible for statutory services, but they often have, as Caroline's out, outlined, um, care and support needs. So one of the things that you can do is people register with your practices um, from the hotels and as part of their onward onward care is is to request that social services undertake a needs assessment or a human rights assessment and this will help outline any of the the underlying care and support needs that somebody might have into the longer term um, and also to support what sort of accommodation they might need and people can be housed um, even if they don't have eligibility for statutory services uh, by the No Recourse to Public Funds teams. And there's a link there to the No Recourse to Public Funds network, um, which has lots of free resources available. Um, next slide, please. Um, and the even thornier issue of NHS charging, which remains extremely controversial, um, and um, something that all the Royal Colleges, including the Royal College of GPs and the Academy for Medical Royal Colleges, so pan college response to end NHS charging because of the, the harms that it has led to it in, 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 the, in the context of people attending late for serious illness, uh, fearing access to healthcare might lead to a charge which can interrupt their immigration applications. Um, but one of the important things to know is that primary care is free for everyone, regardless of their immigration status. And currently testing and treatment for coronavirus is not chargeable. But that said, um, an organisation called Patients Not um, Passports recently published some research which showed that migrants are still not coming forward um, because of the hostile environment during the pandemic. And they're still being asked to produce um, evidence that they're eligible for treatment, which um, is, is not required. Um, some secondary care is still potentially chargeable, um, but urgent and necessary treatment, which is deemed by the clinician, so it's a clinician's decision, um, should not be should not be withheld. And that's very clear, I think, within what is very long guidance. But I, I do think that that is clear. Um, 
we are hoping to do a third webinar um, on uh, migrant healthcare going forward. But in the meantime, Doctors of the World um, have got excellent resources available, including something like 50, more than 50 languages about COVID information uh, translated. Uh, so their, their website is excellent. And I'll talk a little bit about the Safer Surgeries um, Toolkit and Safer Surgeries Accreditation if you're interested in becoming a Doctors of the World Safer Surgery. Next slide, please. So some of the key learning points from um, our webinar today um, is to hold in mind complex trauma and the value and importance of the trusting relationship um, and the opportunity that um, uh, that having um, people in the hotels has has uh, lent us during this time um, to support them into registration to reduce some of the um, isolation and the support networks that could help somebody uh, turn their lives around. Um, that, that key point from Caroline of starting from where the person is and what's urgent for them and remembering that you can't solve everything at once and to draw on the wider networks that are often uh, available. We know from research evidence that people who are experiencing homelessness have often had many contacts with a range of services, um, but they may not have um, had somebody coordinating um, all of those different aspects, so they fall in between the gaps. Um, anger is often um, uh, a result of fear um, and fear underpins uh, many of um, uh, challenging emotions. Um, we know that infections and severe illnesses, including severe mental illness, are particularly common. So be vigilant for these um, and remember that um, brain injury is also uh, common. So changes in behaviour or somebody who becomes at risk of homelessness, think of frailty, think of brain injury. Next slide, please, Caroline. There are many things that you can do. We've, we've touched on some of these, um, of course, registering people who are experiencing homelessness or social exclusion. Uh, can some of your appointments be flexible? Um, you can add an alert into your notes uh, to highlight that somebody is homeless and, and therefore the reception staff are then able to know um, to uh, offer more flexibility around their appointment or if they're uh, turn up late, identifying people who are shielding and recording that um, and supporting them um, to maintain accommodation as part of their shielding. Um, there is already uh, Sam Dorney Smith, a, a very experienced nurse colleague of ours, has developed a homeless health template which is available for use immediately on EMIS and System 1 and your practice can also use that too. Um, there have been a number of really great examples of enhanced services and specialist commissioning for services for homeless and inclusion health groups. Um, one borough in London um, created a directly enhanced service for every practice um, as part of its admission avoidance work um, and that included training and also creating more flexible practice appointments for people experiencing homelessness. Other other boroughs have and CCGs have um, uh, formally funded specialist services like the Pathway Homelessness Teams um, or Outreach Nurse Services um, where, where they're needed and those have um, had an amazing um, impact on improving the health and engaging um, homeless people into um, into healthcare services and supporting them around a range of other issues, for example, um, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, uh, psychological services as well. Next slide, please, Caroline. There is lots of free training available. Um, one of them is the Safe Surgeries Training, which is run by Doctors of the World. Um, they've taught many thousands of uh, GP registrars around the country. Um, and if you're interested in becoming a safer surgery, um, you can click on the link and um, speak to doctors of the world about running the training at your practice um, and enhancing um, the work that you're doing um, with vulnerable groups. Next slide, please. Um, Fair Health is a deep end. We haven't talked much about deep end general practice, but it's um, it's a, a very much a grassroots movement um, focused on um, 
on working in areas of poverty um, and recruiting and, re and training and retaining GPs to work in those areas. And Fair Health um, is in Yorkshire and Humber, and they have lots of free resources and totally open access um, uh, online learning modules. So you don't even need to register to do those, including one on migrant health if you want to learn more about that. Um, pathway in the Faculty for Homeless and Inclusion Health. You can become a, a member of the faculty and join that for free. Um, the standards for service providers and also for commissioners, as well as lots of published work and some training, including some free training for um, practice uh, receptionists is available on the website. Um, Animo is a mental health uh, training um, uh, platform and there are a number of resources there um, that were produced for the Mayor of London that are still accessible and free um, and Homeless Link also has uh, lots of information about local services. Um, Healthy London Partnership um, has information on their website about homelessness and COVID-19 um, but also um, wider resources um, are available including um, substance misuse protocols um, during the pan for use during the pandemic and beyond, and access to the free uh, at right to care cards for um, for people trying to register with practices. You can report a rough sleeper through Streetlink, and for anyone who's interested in um, in research in primary care and homelessness, there's a, a really interesting study called the Hearth Study, which looked at homeless health care provision around um, England, and that's on the King's College website. Next slide, please, Caroline. So some key points for the next webinar, webinar two, which is really focused on engagement and barriers to healthcare, thinking about safeguarding um, and um, some summaries from the safeguarding adults reviews um, and how to make your practices um, more inclusive um, and more flexible. Next slide, please. That's on Thursday, by the way, um, and I think that's a lunchtime um, if that's helpful. Uh, for anybody who couldn't attend in the evening and that's how to contact us. Thank you so much Zana and thank you Caroline. James Thornton here again from HLP. I think we're going to do a bit of Q&A now. Thanks for um, ending with the, the nod to Thursday as well. So that is 12.30 to 1.30 on Thursday. Uh, and again, the links should all be on the HLP website and can share those again afterwards with everyone. Um, so a few quick questions. We have one a reflection, I think, first for you both just to, to think on from Mark Brennan. So Mark says, uh, recognising that homelessness is a public health issue as much or even more than a housing issue, it's potent there is essential to take this opportunity to make some significant progress in truly resolving homelessness as opposed to simply managing it. So great statement, not a long one there, but any, any reflections present us from there? Oh. Couldn't agree I, think, well. <laughs> I think what Caroline said today in the meeting is that um, you know the situation that we're in currently is the culmination of you know a decade of austerity of hostile environment. Um, it's not going to be resolved immediately, um, but by all our sort of combined and joint efforts, um, I think you know Mark is right. We you know we really can. Um, there is really an opportunity to end to end homelessness right now or to certainly dramatically improve it and to really engage uh, the population um, in lots of different aspects of, of meaningful activity of healthcare, of employment, um, of housing together. Yeah, and I and I think that there really is a need at sort of at every level, including national level, to have real joining up of health, housing, social care, um, but also DWP, criminal justice, because this is all everything is is and and obviously the ministries of of, of, of housing, um, because it, it really does have to be approached in a joined up way, both at national level and at local level. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. Um, question here from and forgive me if I get this uh, incorrect my pronunciation, Nirali Sisodia. Homeless people have trouble accessing dental care. Are there, oh, disappeared up my screen. Are there dental HCPs looking into this? HCPS, I should say. Any any knowledge on that, guys? Or 
Yeah, well, we heard today, so there is, um, in fact, there's a, a leaf, there is quite a lot of work going on, actually, um, and there is access to some community dentistry and also a couple of, of hospitals where people can go. But this is actually, interestingly, and it's a, it's a really, really great and important question because it's come up as the number one health need along with mental health problems of people within the hotels. So it's actually being self-recognised as a huge issue, and it is a huge issue. Um, but there is some work going on on this, and there is work on working on inclusion. Um, and I don't know, Zana, if you've got anything um, so one of my colleagues, Janine Doherty, is a specialist inclusion health GP and her research is, look, part of it was mapping the current provision of dental care uh, for people experiencing homelessness. And I'll touch base after this webinar, I'll touch base with Janine and see, I'm not sure yet whether she's published that mapping exercise, but that might be a really useful thing to share. Obviously, at the moment, dentists are just winding back um, up again. If anyone's interested on the Groundswell website, Groundswell are going to be doing the webinar on Thursday. They've done some amazing research about the experiences of um, people experiencing homelessness and their oral health with really shocking statistics on the number of people who self both self-medicate with drugs and alcohol because of dental pain, but also self-remove their teeth, which I know sounds um, horrific and is horrific it's something that's increasingly happened um, but let me touch base with Janine and I'll get back to you with any mapping work that's been done on that. Yes and I think and also to follow up I think so Pathway also did some linking with Eastman Dental Clinic as well mm -hmm. back, and and they found the yeah so so where people had some really um, really serious dental issues and the impact on their lives people's lives on having their dental health um, addressed was absolutely extraordinary. So there's, again, been some lovely work um, published on that, which is on the Pathway website. But I think when we get this leaflet that is being co-done uh, between um, somebody from Public Health and the NHS, um, it should go, it'll go on the HLP website as well. So there's a leaflet, an information leaflet for people who are leaving hotels and for people who are homeless. So that should be accessible for everybody as well to, to then share uh, with, with, with their patients. And I think that's uh, almost ready to go, having shared a few bits of information with the, the Pathway team earlier. So we're almost there. A uh, few more questions, guys, if you can bear with us. So uh, Siobhan Shepherd has asked, uh, how could we use GP slash primary care data to help build our understanding of key factors to monitor, to help prevent homelessness? So to build understanding of effective interventions. It's a big question. Might be one we want to question. take away. And one of the things that I mentioned was the we're not very good at is recording information about homelessness. Um, hospitals are not very good at it. Primary care isn't very good at it. It's not a requirement to record that information, which, again, sounds very surprising that even in secondary care, they don't record um, housing status when somebody arrives, because that would probably help you with your discharge planning uh, quite early on. Um, and, and one of the things that would be really useful is if every practice were to download Sam Dorney Smith's EMIS template and start using that, because that really records very, very thoroughly lots of different aspects, not just of someone's health and those core health issues that Caroline um, described during the, the presentation, but lots of key information about their access to benefits, about um, their housing status, their wider needs, for example, literacy, um, need for interpreters. And as you go through that template, you really build a very robust picture of where somebody starts, but then also um, what sort of interventions you might need, not just as a practice, but maybe as a CCG, for example, do you need social prescribers um, to help support patients to access things like benefits or to support them to attend housing yeah. appointments? So that would be that's one exiting. of the one things that I would suggest uh, every practice do going forward. It's a really simple thing. It's available immediately. Caroline, any? Yeah, no, I think I think it's the once I think you're absolutely right in terms of we're, we're, we're missing out on so much data and information which can build up the the can can demonstrate the need really the needs that there are for this population and firstly we need to be actually coding people's housing status and and, and that's not done at all 
uh, routinely within the NHS or within secondary care or primary care. So it's, it's incredibly important so that then we can actually really, really look at this and address this. And and get weight behind behind the the needs and so and therefore you know the advocacy for for better resourcing. inclusive funding and resourcing yeah brilliant thank you guys i think we have the emis template on the hlp web page but if not we could share a link to it i'm sure in the chat afterwards as well um, a few more questions. Uh, Sue Sylvester uh, has asked, and again, this might be one I'm not sure if we can answer directly, but let's give it a crack. So the accommodation provided to the homeless during COVID has provided beneficial effects on health and nutrition. What can we do to ensure this continues? And the second part to that, do you have any insight on what the governmental plans are? Caroline probably does on the government yeah. plans. <laughs> Uh, OK, so um, the government is saying no one should return to the street. Um, we know that there is um, there's a commitment at local level and at national level that um, everybody is found some form of accommodation. So I know that um, in London, the local authorities are trying very hard and working with the um the housing providers the, the front line the um the homelessness providers to get as many people as possible um, assigned in into uh, private rented accommodation other housing association accommodation but it is obviously a real concern because the need is so huge and um, and I, I so the reality is I'm not quite sure how it's going to actually happen um, in reality, though everyone is saying they're working on it. The other issue that is going to be as a really knotty issue is that about 50 percent well, well, a range between, I don't know, maybe 40 percent of people have no recourse to public funds potentially have immigration issues so there is a drive i think there's quite a lot of immigration advice and support being offered and also there's a whole employment arm um to support people into employment particularly people who um uh, have no recourse um but um there's it's 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 a huge amount of work and it's not going to be um it's it's certainly not going to be um it's not going to be a, a beautiful rosy picture as we would all wish it were and I think it's going to be a, a lot of hard work and there's it's going to be some some very difficult things happening if only we could use this as an opportunity unknown to unknown participant really, is now exiting really ensure that everybody did stay in for good but that is certainly what what everyone is saying but um, I don't um, know if on the the uh, point about continuing the health and nutrition, the good work that's happened there, continuing on, is there anything that we're able to do, or is that beyond uh, beyond the kind of uh, possibilities of what practices can be putting well, in place? I think it's a lot practices can do. So I think at least in terms of health, that's that's one thing that we can really really work together to to deal with. So um, I think you know as as we've said, if if we can, you know, we're we're hoping that not even everyone's got registered with a GP since being in the hotel because it's been such a very very it's few people fun. actually very you know there's there's not been a lot of resourcing for people or for for time but the aim to tr at least make sure that everyone can get registered e at least if not in the hotel but once they move on and so that's going out to everybody working in primary care to really try and be as inclusive as possible and start from where someone is and and, and bear in mind that actually nutrition is a real issue and, and actually supplementary nutritional supplements can be really, really valuable and uh, helpful. And lots of people have low must scores. So, you know, really, really important to, to, to work with all of that. Um, but Zana, I'm sure you've got more to. I think one of the things that obviously has been key during this pandemic has been food. <laughs> Um, you know, on every level, food and toilet rolls have been, you know, up on the list of priorities and feeding the vulnerable, I think, has been, you know, this kind of national agenda. Um, many charities um, are now uh, cooking fresh food, providing that to their communities. So linking in and providing information to patients in the waiting room or when you see them of food banks, of places where they can get hot meals and collect hot meals meals every day um, can go a long way to supporting that nutrition and Caroline's right in in this in this cohort um, the prescribing of nutritional supplements can be very important and a, and a useful adjunct to 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 more nutritious uh, dietary intake as well 
Yes. Um, a quick one, I think. Next, if we, uh, another one from Sue, I think. Are there any projects around recycling glasses for poor eyesight for the homeless that you're aware of? I was reading that one, Sue, and I think um, uh, one of the things that we've actually not mentioned is about the HC2 forms um, and um, that the vast majority of people, I have to say, I've never had anyone turned down from a HC2 application uh, for free prescriptions, free dental care, um, free uh, sight checks and glasses. Um, I'm sure that the local opticians do have services for um, for recycling um, and reusing glasses, but they will also, um, as long as somebody's got a valid HC2, um, and even with a sort of short note from a GP saying, please, can you see this person and not charge them? We're sorting out their HC2. It's coming. Don't worry. Um, they'll usually see the person for free and then organise um, a pair of NHS spectacles for them. Um, so just, yes, yeah, so, so sorry we forgot to mention the HC2 forms. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Um, next on the chat, uh, Nirali has reflected back on the homelessness work in Leicester and how they've managed to get free dental treatment. So maybe Fantastic. there's something Nirali can share with us all there. Uh, we have a question from Sabah Ray again. Sorry if I've got my pronunciations wrong and now I've lost you on the chat, so just bear with me while I scroll back up. Primary care and PCNs have an important role to play in preventing homelessness. The role of social prescribers to identify those at risk of homelessness and linking them to local housing offices and DWP slash DV services. And I think it then cuts off those. I'm not sure if we're asking a question, they're just reflecting back, really. Okay, so there's a huge yeah. role to play for the whole system, I think, is what we're saying there. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and you know, and, and there's also other resources that currently many of them are closed, but hopefully opening soon, like the Citizens Advice Bureaus, Shelter um, Advice Services, um, who are hugely, hugely supportive, um, Crisis Skylight Centres, um, who also have, um, they also have specialist services for EA nationals, not just around um, supporting them around housing, but also around employment um, and private rental and um, uh, arranging EU settled status applications. Um, so the consideration around the role of a social prescriber and there's increasing research looking at the role of social prescribers, which I think is really, um, really helpful um, to, uh, you know, to, to underpin their value um, within your PCN or indeed within your CCG, um, I think is a is a really proactive and positive thing to do. Yeah, I agree. And I think it is something that, you know, whether or not each PCN or CCG at least could have an inclusion health lead that actually and then actually seeing what, what is happening in your area and then ensuring that then social yeah. prescribers can actually really be be used to, to facilitate support for this group. Brilliant stuff. There's a few more. Uh, Seema, who I think has joined us from NHS Haringey, uh, thanks you both for a great presentation, I would agree. And a practical question about the EMIS template. So mm -hmm. is it designed for multiple consultations or for one? The feedback uh, they've had from other GPs is that it's very long and somewhat daunting. What would be a way around or would a way around this be for several appointments, they ask. Any reflections on that at all, guys? It is it is quite a long one. I think it's um, the nurses, the way that we do it at, our, at, our, at Great Chapel Street is that the initial assessment, the nurses and GPs do a really thorough population of that template. And then when you've got an alert there that you know that somebody's homeless, whenever you speak to them or you see them, you can then you know you'll ask them oh they're home. okay where are they staying right now um has anything changed have they managed that benefits application that wasn't done last time um it is tabbed so you can um you can actually just select say the specific tab that you want to record into um i, I do i do hear what you're saying that it is quite it is quite long but it's i think it's designed for a really thorough initial assessment it's designed to be adapted and adopted for different organizations as well um so you don't have to necessarily use the whole thing you could trim it down to the key things that you really uh, want to pick up on the stuff that's really important to uh, to record um, and and just use it as a kind of check in when you're uh, contacting um, contacting someone 
it's quite nice having all the different bits there, the preventative, the vaccinations, um, the housing and immigration status. It, it can be quite helpful to have those different bits there, but try you can have a look at it and try and condense it down with um, with your um, practice manager into something that's more uh, more manageable in a day to day sense and use. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, scrolling on to the next questions, Nirali has suggested uh, what it's reflected back that uh, they've managed to provide some free glasses as well as dental care. So I think uh, I think we'll be coming to you for some some tips <laughs> there. But uh, thanks for sharing that. I think our next question itself is coming from uh, it's Kunigiri Girish. Um, what do you see is the major gap in service to the homeless, and how can charities help with this? Um, that's really interesting. I think there's there's lots of gaps and it depends on the charities, but I think certainly um, the, some really successful advocacy charities. So Groundswell is an amazing charity. It's supporting people to get to health appointments. Um, so um, if you are lucky enough to have um, Groundswell um, commissioned within your area, they're they're a wonderful charity and they they have they are they are a national charity now. Um, so they're usually um, funded through CCGs. So again, if you have a high number of people experiencing homelessness in your area or with these complex needs and groundswell are not commissioned, try and get your CCG to look into that because I think that's a, that could be something that's really, really helpful. So groundswell helps support people get registered with GPs, but they also help um, people get to their hospital appointments, um, supporting them um, uh, with those complexities. But you'll hear more about that next on Thursday because actually we have somebody from Groundswell who's going to be talking as well. Um, but I think other charities will depend, obviously people with immigration issues, there's huge need for charities to support people with immigration issues. Um, so a lot of people have um, immigration issues and but do have rights to be here um, or have ways of actually exploring their, their rights and their needs. So again, really, really important. Um, and I mean, so I think it depends, there's so many issues associated with with homelessness and vulnerable housing, such as people with domestic violence experience um, or experiencing other other addiction issues, so I think I think there's 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 a huge amount that charities can do. But I think you know actually trying to help a work with people's priorities and work from where they are is sort of fundamental and working from what their priorities are and supporting them. But Zana, I, I don't know if you've got anything. Oh, I think just reflecting back on what you mentioned earlier about having a, uh, you know, a CCG lead for inclusion health to help coordinate um, each area is going to be different. You'll have different providers of food. You'll have different um, substance misuse services. Some areas will have shelter. Some will, will have a crisis skylight centre. Um, so someone to, you know, within each CCG, uh, every practice to support every practice to be inclusive, to make it as easy as possible, um, and to um, and to support some of that joined up working with other providers that are often, as I as I mentioned, contacts is not an issue. People who are experiencing homelessness often have lots of contacts. It's just that it's all a bit disjointed and fragmented. So someone within your CCG who can who can coordinate that a nurse or a, or a GP um, or a social prescriber who's who's a lead for that I think would be a great uh, step forward not just for people who are experiencing homelessness and so social exclusion but for for all patients particularly as we move into quite an uncertain time lots of people losing their jobs lots of financial uncertainty we we don't know what the next six twelve eighteen months will bring but implementing some uh, some robust roles that can help navigate this this uncertain time for people and the variety of needs that they will have could be really really useful for for every area to to think about. And and I suppose just the only thing I would add as well, thinking uh, about it, is is advocating around housing as well. So we also know that within our um, we work within we're fortunate enough to work within multidisciplinary teams in a hospital where we have we actually have a housing worker, social worker, OT, nurse, um, and the the 
in terms of actually advocating for people to get into accommodation when they are um, homeless, so this is not coming from the hotels, but if they're, uh, if they're from the street or if they're in inappropriate, insecure housing, um, can be really, really daunting and very, very difficult. So actually having support with advocating for those presentations, helping people get all the information together that they need, all the ID together that they need, any medical evidence that they need, and supporting that and then going with them to what can be often quite uh, can feel quite hostile um, interviews with people at the local authority for housing uh, they shouldn't be but they can be hostile and I think so support around that as well yeah really important point fantastic thank you guys that's uh, so we've run to the end of the questions there's been some great feedback from the delegates so please do look at that afterwards um, beautifully segued into handing over for Thursday session so again that's half past 12 till 1 30 where we've got uh, path uh, groundswell amongst others joining us then um, I'll thank you both so thank you Dr Caroline Shulman thank you Dr Zana Khan and uh, thank you to our delegates this evening for sticking with us it was a lot of you we'll be sharing this recording shortly and yeah hopefully look forward to seeing you on Thursday thank, thank you everyone. everyone thank you very Thanks much